Welcome to a special Pearson Center webinar today as we discuss residential schools and reconciliation. And as we launch the, a dialogue on diversity at the Pearson Center, which we will be doing for the rest of 2021. My name is Andrew Cardozo and I'm president of the Pearson Center, a progressive think tank where we address the critical issues of the day. At the start, I want to recognize that the Pearson Center is headquartered on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. I'm going to change our usual format and try and get to the our discussion as soon as possible. At the end of the webinar, I'll do a, a, a bit of an intro to the Pearson Center and a thank you to our sponsors. We're deeply honored today to host Michelle Good, the award-winning author of Five Little Indians. I want to tell you that Michelle Good is of Cree ancestry, a descendant of the Battle River Cree, and a member of the Red Pheasant Cree Nation. She has worked with Indigenous organizations since she was a teenager, and at 40, changed course and went to law school. She's practiced law in public and private sectors since then, primarily advocating for residential school survivors. Most recently, she graduated from UBC with a fine arts uh, degree in creative writing in 2014, where her novel, Five Little Indians, first started taking shape. Her poetry and short stories have appeared in a number of publications. I want to congratulate Michelle Good for the awards she has received for this book, which are the HarperCollins UBC Best New Fiction Prize, the Governor General's Award for English Language Fiction, the Amazon.ca First Novel Award, and the Kobo Emerging Writer Prize. It is clear that this book is being widely recognized for its critical importance at this time. It is available at all bookstores and can be purchased in stores or online. Although I understand it may be out of print and hard to get in some places because it is so popular. I am host, uh, I, I'm, while I am hosting today, um, I'll be a bit more in the background. I want to welcome back to the Pearson podium, Dr. Gahante Horn Miller, who will be moderator for today's discussion. She plays an important role at Carleton University of Mohawk ancestry. She's the inaugural assistant vice president of Indigenous Initiatives and the Office of the Provost and Vice President Academic. She's also an associate professor at the School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies. Welcome back to Pearson, Dr. Horn Miller. Quickly, the format is as follows. Following a discussion for about 45 minutes, we will take questions from the audience. So please send in your questions using the question box on your screen, and we will get to those at the 45 minute mark. We will end at around um, 10, 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time or 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, with that, I will ask uh, one question and then ha hand over to uh, Gahante Horn Miller. Um, Michelle Good, I wanna ask you about your career. You've had a varied and interesting career. Uh, but I sense I feel there's a, there's a clear path that went all the way through to get to this point of writing this book. Uh, do tell us a bit about your career. Well, um, as you stated, I started working with Indigenous organizations when I was 18 years old. I had just aged out of foster care, and by coincidence, if you believe in such a thing, I was introduced to Chief George Manuel in British Columbia, and um, I had just listened to. A presentation that he was making and I was just astounded. I was just so amazed at his uh, brilliance and his activism and um, and so I approached him about doing some work about contributing and that's where things began and I, I worked with uh, Indigenous organizations, First Nations directly and so on. Um, but since I was a child I had always been um, enamored of the concept of justice and mistakenly thought that I might be taking part in that if I became a lawyer. <laughs> um, so uh, when I was 40, I, I, um, I went to law school and was uh, called to the bar in 2000 and then um, was articling with a boutique firm that uh, did primarily Aboriginal law. And, uh, and it was there that another lawyer from a firm that was cooperating with the firm I worked for um, asked me if I would take on five residential school cases 
And this is when these cases were still in litigation and the federal government was fighting them brutally in open court where survivors were being made to talk in painstaking detail about the worst experiences of their lives in open court and to be you know, quite viciously cross-examined and challenged and brutalized. And, um, um, and so that was quite an experience. And then I, I became involved in modifying the process um, so that uh, these cases wouldn't be dealt with through litigation, but through alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, and then ultimately the independent assessment process. But I went on and I, I advocated for survivors uh, for 14 years. And um, it, while I was still, I ended up having my own little law firm. And, and while I was doing that, um, I had also been threatening for many, many, many years to write a book. And so I, I knew that if I didn't have a structure for that, that it likely wouldn't happen. And so I, um, I, uh, took the Masters of Fine Arts at UBC to create a structure around which I could start writing this, this book, which is what I did. And um, so in a nutshell, the Reader's Digest version of, <laughs> of, uh, of how life unfolded, there you go. <laughs> yeah, and do you still practice law? No, um, I, I retired from the law in uh, 2014. Came back briefly, but then thought, no, I'm I'm done with that. So, um, I do still work as a legal professional, which is you know sort of a regulatory distinction. I I work as a uh, as an adjudicator with a couple of provincial tribunals, but primarily I'm trying to put out another book. I'm trying to complete another novel. Yeah. 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 Well, well, thank you for writing this book, and I'll I'll turn uh, the platform over to Dr. Ron Miller to take you through that. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to be uh, engaging with you today and, and sharing in a conversation. Uh, well, that's quite mutual, let me say. <laughs> I, uh, I actually started um, listening to the book on audio, on the mm -hmm. Audible, uh, and I was beating along, doing my thing, and, and I found it extremely, I have to say, painful painful to listen to and I know that um, you know coming from law and then at some point you decided that uh, you wanted to write a book um, can you explain to to the audience um, what that moment was like in terms of when you decided well I need to I need to put this down and what was it that you were that you what was that process or what was that moment like and what, wh why did you want to write this book? Well, you know, it wouldn't be quite accurate to sort of say it was a moment. It was an idea that evolved over, you know, years and years that I thought, you know, I'd been threatening to write a book for, for a long, long time. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I really thought about it in terms of, you know, how can I convey this reality to people? You know, you would think that years and years and years of litigation with all of this being, you know, in the media, being in the world, right? My expectation was that, you know, Canada generally would begin to open its collective heart, if you will, you know, mm -hmm. once they started seeing the nature of abuses that kids were suffering at these schools. But that didn't happen. You still have these you know, anytime you see a residential school story in the media, you still have these comments, you know, that that come up where, you know, why can't they just get over it? And, oh, I'm so sick of hearing about this, the rolling of the eyes, et cetera, et cetera. And so that was why I decided that was primarily the the impetus to just get on with it and do it before I got too old to do it. And yeah. uh, And it was to respond to that question, why can't they just get over it? I mm -hmm. think people accepted, were beginning to accept that there were these types of really hideous abuses, but they weren't accepting or um, conceptualizing the real impact of those. And that's what I decided had to be the focus of this book, is the impact both immediately, both individually and collectively. Because, you know, the residential schools were a key implement in the colonial toolkit. 
Mm -hmm. And people, I don't think people, I think people are just now maybe beginning to understand that, you know, trauma has a half-life that continues and continues and continues and therefore impacts not only the individuals involved, but the community, our people generally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, what you're describing is, is we have a term for that in Ganyakeha, in our language. It's Jini Jiwa'a. And it means to make it alive in the minds of the people. So when you describe, that's right. When you describe, you know, how you 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 worked in litigation, you you know, these are facts, right? You're presenting the facts. And here in the book, you're actually using the voices of some young people to bring those facts to life. And that's what we call Jini Jiwa'a. So you're that's you're making beautiful. it alive. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's what I hope to do, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, and that was why, and it, I'm sorry, I've got a big train going by here right now. Um, I'm just gonna go, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna go close my window. It'll help with that background racket. That's fine. Murphy's Law, right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, and I mean, there were there were a lot of drafts in terms of when this book started and, you know, the original draft and how it developed. And um, one of the things that was so important to me was that this was not about the schools per se, but that this was about um, the children and about the tremendous burden of psychological injury that they left the schools with mm -hmm. and how they were so profoundly challenged to even accomplish a modest life you know in not only dealing with that psychological injury but trying to deal with it in the face of profound racism and the fact that they were not welcome in this world whatsoever and that they had no support none and um so so that was why I focused on life after the school with just, I think, sufficient background in terms of things that happened in the school to support the stories as they developed. Um, but, you know, I think with the with the recent revelations, which are certainly not news to us, yeah. um, perhaps people can finally understand that residential school was a life and death experience. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to to have you focus on a couple of the um, the characters in the book and perhaps um, let the audience know a little bit more about the, who they are and maybe perhaps some of the um, the inspiration for them um, if, if you're okay with that well, sure I, I might start with the second part of that the inspiration and uh, I mean, people ask me that a lot, like, you know, are these based on actual people, on actual stories and so on and so forth. And mostly they find their genesis in stories that my mom told me about her experiences at residential school. Um, but they also um, are kind of a very technical construction. Uh, I read hundreds and hundreds of psychological assessments. And so, when I first started writing the book, I started with one character, it was with Kenny, and uh, the f I wrote the first paragraph in a MFA workshop and immediately knew that I was going to need more characters, that if I wanted to um, really, really explore the scope of injury that, that survivors suffered, that I would need more, mm -hmm. I would need more characters. So what I did instead was I, I identified five different types of harms that people suffered in the schools. And mm -hmm. then what I did was I extrapolated from that the type of psychological injury they would have, be it post-traumatic stress disorder, OCD, anger issues, addiction issues, all of those kinds of things that we're so familiar with. And then from there, extrapolated in terms of how a life would unfold carrying all of those kinds of, of injuries and I think that's what we see in the relationships between the characters in the book is that you know they 
they in effect create community for themselves when they discover or when they experience that there is really no welcoming community for them anywhere. And um, and so, you know, that's that's what I did. But, you know, there is, you know, the suffering in this book, but there's also a lot of love, you know, and a lot of joy and a lot of strength and determination. And in particular, I like to think about the relationship between Lucy and Clara. And, you know, Lucy, Lucy sort of comes off as this very kind of passive, you know, peaceful, you know, her OCD issues, she hides away in her house and so on. But, you know, she accomplished her goal, she became a nurse. Mm -hmm. And Clara, who is, you know, fiery and furious, um, and particularly furious with God, um, is her, you know, ongoing support, lifelong support between those two for each other. And that's a real reality in, and I, I should say that I was living in Vancouver, as I said, I had um, just aged out of foster care at 18. And uh, I was living in that community and trying to deal with some of the same things that that my characters were trying to deal with in terms of trying to find work with no support, no education, nothing. Um, you know, in terms of, of, you know, carrying my own burdens that, you know, arise from when you're taken away from your family and so on and so forth. Um, and so some aspects of, of that book were very easy to write because I just had to go into the memory bank movies. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? But also in terms of where the inspiration comes from, virtually every person that I worked with, Indigenous organizations, were survivors or siblings or parents of survivors. And so this was a lived experience for me. It wasn't something that I had to learn about. It was something that was just part of my world in a very big way. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> so, yeah. Yeah, I remember, um, you know, I, I, I teach uh, at Carleton University and um, when, during the TRC, um, I would have these discussions with some of my, all my students about the TRC, um, some of the things that we were learning. Um, and then eventually when the final report came out, um, I would talk about the, the calls to action. But in there, I would also talk about, in order to con contextualize it, I would talk about the impacts of the residential schools as a way to um, show the students. And And I remember there was a huge long long list of impacts and I you know as you were talking I was thinking my goodness you could have had a hundred characters based on those impacts right yeah there's so much to draw from what why in particular did you choose those impacts and not others well I think I think because they are the most prevalent uh, in my own experience okay. um uh, in the things that I've observed throughout my life, you know, the challenging, you know, the the, the challenges to maintaining relationships, um, Kenny, that constant running that was so entrenched with him, even when he was free, right, um, and the ability, the inability to trust or to be close to anybody, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, of course, you know, the anxiety that we see in, in in, uh, uh, in in Lucy that drives her to this obsessive compulsive behavior, um, mm -hmm. the rage that blinds Clara um, and Kenny, you know, they both, and Howie, you know, who, they both end up in sort of violent situations because of this blinding rage that mm -hmm. they have in response to the treatment that they've, that they've experienced. Mm -hmm. And um, so those were ones that or impacts that to me were were far more prevalent or more pervasive in in many survivors and but you know as you say I could have had a hundred characters but you know the book would have never ended <laughs> yeah you, you could yeah. You, maybe there's more volumes there I don't know <laughs> maybe <laughs> you know and I mean one thing that I one thing that I only touched on and I think is something that that needs further uh, exploration in fiction is the impact on on communities, mm -hmm. um, the collective impact that we still feel today in our communities. Because 
you know, trauma has a half-life, right? And you bring, uh, you know, traumatized people come home and they bring their trauma home. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it impact, you know, if you're in a stressful situation, you're going to have trauma responses. Um, mm -hmm. Not only that, but, you know, children, are, children of survivors are observing their parents have trauma responses. So they're learning trauma responses to the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that broader intergenerational harm is one that I think could be explored in a much deeper way. Because I think people still resist the notion that there is in fact intergenerational harm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I can ask you and, and feel free not to answer, um, but you talk about being in foster care and also I know that uh, your mother went to residential school as well and I just wondered if you would perhaps uh, if that was the reason why you why you were removed from the home was because of the impacts um, on the from the residential school on your mother and her ability to care for you um I would say sort of in a uh to a degree, yes, but mm -hmm. not in the way one might expect. My oh. mother was a force of nature. <laughs> she was amazing and she accomplished things in her time that were just completely inconceivable at mm -hmm. that time. Um, you know, she was in res school, she contracted TB, she was in a TB sanatorium for three years where she wrote letters every single day to anybody she could think of saying she wanted an education. And so in 1947, long story short here, she ended up with a scholarship to study nursing and midwifery in New Zealand. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. And when she came back, she was, she was met with, you know, all kinds of offers from various universities. And she was, you know, a celebrity. I've got all her documents. It's wonderful. Um, but she was a residential school survivor. She married a, a non-Indigenous man, clearly, and um, and I, I, she never said so, but I, I believe, you know, that my mother got the message very clearly that her indigeneity was an invitation to violence and brutality, mm. and she, I believe that part of her motivation in marrying my father, I know she loved him to death, right, but mm -hmm. was so that we would no longer legally be Indians, her and her children, and therefore we would not be taken to residential school. Uh -huh. And so, you know, I think that was part of the reality, but also um, what happened to me happened outside of my home. I was sexually assaulted when I was very young, and I went, Phew, kind of crazy as a result of it and um and it was she did she didn't because she um to, um, to, I don't know, to just uh, defer her power, if you will, to non-Indigenous people. And that's what she did. And, uh, and I was harmed as a result of it. But on the other hand, I don't know that I would have been apprehended if my mother had not been Indigenous. I don't think I would have been apprehended. So well, be that as it may. Thank you for sharing. I, I'm, I don't mean to open old wounds, but thank you. For sharing with me. I, oh, I appreciate it, and I think it's important to talk about. And I, you know, I've done my work. I, I've worked through it, and I don't suffer from it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I don't give it the power to hurt me anymore. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but as you can understand, some of these things I understand from a very personal perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, let's 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 talk about the the more recent events. Mm -hmm. If if that's okay, yeah. um, we have the 215 children's remains. Um, we also have the announcement that was made yesterday. Um, what are your thoughts? And and when you heard the first one, what what were your thoughts? And what did you do? You know, it was it was strange because I I just felt numb, you know, and and I think primarily because I was 
you know, we've known about this forever. My office is in the old residential school in Kamloops. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, people have been talking about this for decades. Well, even longer, you know, about how kids would be there one day and gone the next and nobody would know what happened to them and they were never spoken of again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and parents whose kids just disappeared into thin air that couldn't get any answers about it. And, you know, so it was sort of like, this is news, but it's not news people. And then, you know, close on the heels of that was just, I was just furious. I was just furious because, you know, you were speaking earlier about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the calls to action. And if you look at the calls to action, um, 71 through 76, they fall under the heading of missing children and burial information. And in those calls to action, um, Murray Sinclair and the other commissioners basically wrote a roadmap for the federal government in terms of how to address this. And they attached a budget figure, figure to it, which was quite modest when you think about, you know, federal coffers and so on. They, they attached a budget of a million and a half dollars to protect sites and to begin the process of, of uh, collecting burial information that the church parties have and so on. And mm -hmm. the federal government under Harper at the time said no. They denied the budget request and nothing has been done um, since then to fulfill those particular calls to action. And so, you know, it's not it's not news, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it might be news, but it's not. People have known about this for a long, long time. And I mean, even longer than that. If you go back to 1907, Dr. Peter Bryce who was the chief medical officer, as I'm sure you know, um, mm -hmm. of the Department of Indian Affairs, was um, commissioned to write uh, or to do a medical um, a survey of the health conditions in the residential schools. And when he reported back, he reported back that um, if the federal government had been trying to create institutions that would promote the transmission of tuberculosis, that they had successfully done that with the residential schools. And, you know, Duncan Campbell Scott, superintendent of Indian Affairs at the time, said, too bad. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. Basically, you know, he said that, you know, while it's true that they may die in the schools more readily than they do in their villages, that's not enough to deter us from seeking the final solution to the Indian problem. So there'll be no Indian problem, there'll be no Indian department. And mm -hmm. so, and later in an essay written by himself, Scott stated that he was of the view that uh, up to 50% in sub -school, some schools were dying, mm -hmm. 50%. And so, you know, we have this confirmed number before these discoveries of some 3,100 um, children that died in residential schools. Um, Murray Sinclair suggested that it could be as many as 15 to 25,000. I think that's even modest. So, but, <laughs> you know, you know, how can the government in good conscience, you know, uh, say, oh, hearts and mind, all children's matter, as though, as though this is, you know, a terrible shock to them, you yeah. know, this has happened. It's ridiculous. It's offensive. And it has to stop. What what I see is that, you know, there's a difference between be, telling the story. We've been telling this story for quite some time. I mean, that's what you're talking about here. Yes. Right? We truth told during the, the TRC. We truth told during RCAP. We've mm -hmm. truth told since the schools were in existence and no one listened. But now, now the difference is that we have tangible evidence, right, in the bones of these children, right? That's and right. That's, that's a big difference because Western science says you need to have tangible evidence for it to be real, right? Yeah. And we've been talking ourselves blue in the face saying, no, we know our children are here. And now we have the bones. And now we have the bones. And maybe now every residential school site in Canada will become protected under federal law. 
um, whether the school is there or not, whether there are other buildings there or not. I, I heard one person refer to an RV park that they drive by every day and say there's kids buried there, you know, and protect those sites um, and provide the necessary expertise and resources to get on with this work. The kids need to go home. They yes. need to go home. And non-Indigenous people have got to stop relying on Indigenous people to educate them about the horrors that they visited on us. Mm -hmm. They have to accept responsibility for their own education. The time is now. And it's not as if, you know, that, that the world is not full of resources for them to, to learn from. Mm -hmm. what, yeah. what, uh, when you're asked that question, what, what do I do by someone who is um, a, a non-Indigenous, what, what do you say? What is your answer? Well, A, educate yourself, okay, and here's some resources, take a look. Uh, mm -hmm. B, use your privilege. And I know a lot of non-Indigenous people really kind of get upset with the term privilege because they think that it means that they never had to work hard, that they, you know, that they all inherited great wealth and so on and so forth. Um, and that's not what privilege means. What privilege means is that you didn't have to overcome the nature of your existence in order to succeed in life. You didn't have to overcome the color of your skin, your legal status in the world, you know, all of those things in order to try and make a life for yourself. That's what privilege is. And people need to use their privilege to make space for Indigenous people, although we've done a pretty darn good job of making space for ourselves. But mm -hmm. we need to consider, continue with that. And they need also to respect our knowledge, to respect, you know, as you say, the Western sciences, they need the tangible evidence of the bones. Well, you know, all of this all of this response could have happened a hundred years ago if they had only listened to us, if they'd had sufficient respect for us and what we know um, in our own traditional way of knowing and also as witnesses to what happened in these schools. Um, mm -hmm. But that would take a certain respect and, and a certain disrespect for Indigenous people has been woven into the very fabric of Canadian society since the beginning of the colonial effort. Mm -hmm. Early on, you 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 said that um, you went into law to try to understand justice. <laughs> no, it was more that I equated law with justice. Oh, with justice, okay. <laughs> you know that I could participate in a process that promoted justice. I was so naive. <laughs> well, I I wanted to ask you in this context now. That we're looking at you know with with the the children their remains coming to the surface and telling us their story what what does justice mean to you here in this context now oh gosh that's quite a question i know yeah well i don't i don't know right <laughs> um but i think I think if there was a meaningful response in providing those resources, if there was, but justice is only really going to come to us when reconciliation is real. And I look at reconciliation from uh, um, sort of in a way like the definition of reconciliation in a bookkeeping sense. I know it sounds weird, but you know, what that means is when you reconcile your bank account with your statement, right? And so it, it balances. And mm -hmm. that's what has to happen in Canada. It's we have to move beyond symbolic gestures and um, you know apologies. We got you know as Maria Campbell said, we have closets full of sorries. We don't need sorries. We need our land back, right? Mm -hmm. We need we need meaningful shares in in um, or a meaningful share share of the resources of this country in order that we can become self determining again and not reliant on government mm -hmm. and. You know, when we look at this, for example, I look at the example of the the, the Mi'kmaq lobster fishers, where the you know everybody's always yelling about the rule of law, right? When you think of the Wet'suwet'en, they're talking about the rule of law. They look at the Mi'kmaq fishers and they're blowing up their boats and warehouses and so on. 
even though the Supreme Court of Canada says that they are operating completely within their rights, the Mi'kmaq mm -hmm. people and the lobster fishery. And so we have to come to a point where reconciliation means recognition of our rights to participate in a meaningful economic life in this country as well. Um, it means that the authority for our lands, our resources, our peoples, our institutions must be with us. We are not asking for handouts or crumbs from the table. Mm -hmm. What about Indigenous legal orders? What role do... What about that? I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Read everything by John Burroughs. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, you know, John has done just a tremendous amount of work in terms of... Um, explaining Indigenous legal orders and how the the potential is really there for, um, um, I guess, uh, you know, a relationship between Indigenous legal orders and non-Indigenous legal orders. And that, you know, and when I was in law school, John was one of my professors, and I remember him introducing these concepts of Indigenous legal orders, <laughs> you know, and my non-Indigenous classmates going, why are you telling us stories about animals <laughs> but I was sitting there going yes yeah. <laughs> just you know quite fabulous but but and we're starting to see that you know in a small way in terms of you know indigenous courts that are starting and you know we have a few indigenous courts in British Columbia now but it's you know primarily it's it's still diversion it's not so much a recognition of legal orders as a recognition of a different indigenous perspective in dealing with legal issues. But mm -hmm. it is a step forward. And I, I just really hope that I will live long enough to see the day that we have, um, you know, like the two row wampum as it pertains to legal orders, mm -hmm. right? Where there's our way, there's their way. We have mutual respect and mutual recognition, but our jurisdictions are discreet. Good example. <laughs> yeah, I thought you might like that one. <laughs> um, going back to the book now, um, who do you want to read this book? Who, who do you think, who is it for? Well, you know, it, it's for a lot of people. Uh, I'd like everybody to read it, of course. Um, you know, but I, I wrote it, as I say, my original motivation was to respond to that question, why can't they just get over it? Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping all those people that even, you know, just a little bit ask that question. Yeah. Read it. But I also wrote it as a love letter to survivors. You know, I wanted there to be something out there in the world that um, that tells them that they've been heard, that they've been felt, that they're loved and mm -hmm. acknowledged. And so, you know, it, and I get a lot of uh, readers that reach out to me and uh you know, through my web page, they track me down and and um, um, and I've responded really positively that they could relate to the characters and to their experiences and that they're thankful for it. And also intergenerational survivors who could recognize their parents and even grandparents um, in the characters. And so I'm very thankful for that. I really am. Can I um, can I ask you to give us a teaser on what you're working on now? Sure. <laughs> um, it, it's more historical fiction, but this one is a bit more of a challenge because, as I said earlier, I was there in the 70s in Vancouver, so I could just go into the memory bank movies. This one is loosely based on my great grandmother. She was born in 1856 in Saskatchewan, or what is now Saskatchewan was the Northwest Territories then. And um, I was born in 1956, so I kind of like that little circle that we have. Um, she was the niece of Ms. Dahi Masqua, who was Chief Big Bear, who was um, the key negotiator for Treaty 6. So she was there when uh, the Frog Lake incident occurred. She would have been with Big Bear's band. She okay. was there during the resistance, the Métis resistance and so on. So I want to tell the story, but most importantly, she never saw a non-Indigenous person until she was about 18 years old. 
So mm -hmm. in her story, I have a character who lived pre-contact, who lived virtually an untouched traditional life, and then was exposed to the military and legal initiatives of colonialism. And mm -hmm. I, I want to tell that story through her eyes, or this character's eyes, um, and how that experience led to the acceptance of violence against Indigenous women. Wow, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to getting down to writing it. <laughs> Research done, got a couple of chapters in, but things have been busy. <laughs> yeah. Well, good luck on, on, and I hope, I really hope that that you have that you 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 capture the time to do that. I appreciate that. I'm I'm going to start putting my foot down pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, Andrew. Hello, Gahante. I, I might uh, chime in again. Hello, Michelle, again. And uh, I, I'll go through some of the, the questions that are coming in. And uh, Gahante, feel free to, to add your comments as we're going through. Uh, the first, I just want to share with you, uh, there are a, few, a number of questions that have come in, but I just want to share this, something I came across, with, uh, across recently, Michelle. Uh, good. Uh, it's a book called uh, North Toronto. And I'll hold this up. I'll see. If, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but if you can sort of get this, this is a map of Toronto up Young Street, sort of the core of Young Street. Mm -hmm. And what this is is called Original Land Grants. So this is a book that, and these maps that I just showed you date back to the 1870s and early 1800s. So these appeared when the government handed these people land grants, which are now, you know, in like the core of Toronto and every foot of land probably costs a million dollars today but a number of names like um like russell mcdougall kendrick um glasson ruggles etc a lot of english names were given land prime land were given to settlers at the time that land was being taken away from indigenous people and young indigenous children would be taken to residential schools and it just it just to me as this was happening and I, I just came across this book a few days ago it just in such stark relief tells us why some people have it all today and some people don't uh, what, what are your thoughts about these land grants and what was happening with indigenous people at the same time they didn't expect us to survive to be able to say <laughs> Here yeah. is the foundation. Here is the foundation of your wealth and privilege. Okay, mm -hmm. and that was ours. That was ours. So, yeah, give it back. <laughs> That's what I'd like to say. Give it back. That's one thing is that um, it's it's about educating uh, people on the how they have benefited from this process, from our children being placed in these schools, our culture being taken away from us, um, our families being put on reserva reservations. It, it was a way to remove us from our connection to the land and our responsibility to the land, right? Mm -hmm. um, because of the uh, immense resources, it was seen as a way for Canada to build and make money. And people have benefited. That's what the economy was built upon was when we could literally say on the backs of our ancestors literally on the backs of our ancestors yeah. 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 and if you think about things certain policies like I, I i i assume that everybody knows this but it's not necessarily so um that regina used the name of the city of regina used to be pile of bones that mm -hmm. was the name of the city and the bones were bison and buffalo bones and there was a um there was a, a policy of encouraging people to just randomly kill the buffalo and the bison because they were our food, clothing, and shelter. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, people used to ride on the trains through the prairies and they would shoot buffalo from the trains and just leave their carcasses to rot. There is a karmic response that's gonna come, folks. Right? I mean, but when you think about how that decimated our people in terms of being able to be independent and how it created a dependency on rations you mm -hmm. know through a treaty which then became used as leverage 
um, rations would be withheld for whatever the uh, you know objective of the day would have been and that was how the frog lake so-called massacre occurred is that the vicious indian agent there was withholding rations for weeks upon weeks upon weeks people mm -hmm. were starving to death yeah and and then you know the the violent events occurred which were then you know violently responded to by the northwest mounted police who hounded Big Bear's band through the Cypress Hills into Montana. I still have relatives in Montana from then. Mm -hmm. I, I will remind the audience they can send in questions on the question box. Uh, Michelle, here's a question. Um, you said, and quote, I don't give it power to hurt me anymore. Are you referring to, to the triggers? Um, how do you learn to do that? Now, that might be a very huge question, but I wonder if you could comment on that. You learn to look at your well, and I think this, you know, pertains to childhood abuse, is that you learn to look at it through adult eyes as opposed to looking at it through a child's eyes. And you come to understand who is responsible for the harm that was done to you. And you realize that it's not you. <laughs> it's not me. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that begins a journey, um, you know, of understanding your own trauma responses to the world and and um, and choosing something healthier. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, another question there being calls for a commission of inquiry on the unmarked graves. Uh, what should such a commission focus on? I'm sorry, I just get so frustrated with this. There should have been a commission of inquiry a hundred years ago. I mean, it's you know, what I would like to see, I don't really want to talk about an inquiry. I mean, if it happens, it happens and so be it. But what needs to happen is that the resources and expertise need to be made available to Indigenous communities so that they can undertake this work themselves. It, it really needs to happen that way, in my view. And I speak just for myself. With These are just my own opinions. And, uh, you know, but if there was an inquiry, then, you know, it would be absolutely mandatory that these religious organizations cough up the documents, which they're still resisting. Mm -hmm. You know, the Catholic orders are still resisting opening their doors in terms of providing the necessary data, documents, and information. And, you know, without that, I don't know that there is a point to an inquiry. Okay. Um, do you think the, the Pope should be providing a, an apology? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> in a word, you know, but <clears throat> the reason that the Pope is not, and there was some Catholic bishop who was, you know, getting annoyed about responses to the Pope's failure to provide an apology. We've apologized in our diocese, yeah, but you know, the Vatican is a corporation. It's an exceptionally complex corporation that is basically impervious to litigation. But if the Pope, you know, sort of the chairman of the board of the papal corporation, you know, were to offer an apology, and this was part of the reason the federal government didn't want to offer an apology, is that it may be perceived as an admission of liability. And with an admission of liability, we might be able to crack the walls legally of the corporation that is the Catholic Church, the Vatican, right, mm -hmm. with all their riches, all of their plunder. I, I, I'm of the mind that you, you have to go beyond apologizing. I think apologies are words, but they need to be followed by some sort of action and ongoing action, not just a one-off. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little hesitant about uh, receiving apologies because in the past, apologies don't really mean very much. Well, it's absolutely true. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like I said before, Maria Campbell says we have a closet full of apologies what we need is action and mm -hmm. uh, you know maybe the catholic church could take some of its you know ex ex just out of this world wealth and and solve the water problems the potable water problems in our communities you mm -hmm. know they you know as you're saying Kehente, it has to be something meaningful something you know tangible do something right yeah you know, I, I live in Ottawa and um, there have been some large um, church lands that have been sold off, um, you know, very strong old buildings that, that have been there for a long 
time and they've been converted into high-end condos and it just occurs to me as you're talking about that i mean that would be a useful gift that was provided for for housing for indigenous people in urban centers mm -hmm. um, many of whom have housing challenges um, and housing is becoming extremely expensive in many centers i'm sure the church could could give those lands for better use than than selling it off to condo developers i just read an article in the times colonist in victoria about a couple that uh, that bequeathed their beautiful oak bay home to the friendship center to the victoria friendship center and mm -hmm. uh, they had previously uh, bequeathed or or donated a significant parcel of land in the Maritimes to Indigenous people. And, you know, people can do that. I mean, if an individual couple can do that, what could the church do, for God's sake? But it's a matter of will. It's a matter of, you know, making a decision to actually do something. Yeah. yeah. So here, here's a question which I, I think um, will sort of what next, um, and maybe we can, we'll, we'll close on this question, but I wonder if you can, share your thoughts about where would you like where would you like us as a society to be in five years hmm. like what what should we have done now that we know incontrovertibly and the whole society is a little more informed about what indigenous people have been saying for years well um those babies should get home first of all you know all of the every single site where there was a residential school needs to be protected the resources need to be provided to these two indigenous communities to do this necessary work and if we could start to see some things oh i have to avoid profanity here i'm starting to get mad <laughs> you know if if you know for example the federal government could stop litigating against indigenous peoples right yeah. if if this 20 some year battle with indigenous foster kids with you know regarding the discrimination against indigenous foster kids could stop we've got two you know talking out of both sides of their mouth the federal government with oh every child matters right but indigenous child children in foster care matter much much less and you know the canadian human rights commission found in favor of the children that they were being discriminated against in terms of the services that weren't being provided to them and the government keeps appealing it appealing it and refusing to implement the uh orders of the canadian human rights commission so yeah. you know here again we have this this situation about the rule of law okay the, yeah. the canadian human rights commission has the force of law and our government is still fighting indigenous kids May that change. Yeah. Gahanta, any thoughts on that? I'm sure you lost your points, but I, I think on, on that note, you know, um, all those children who, who age out of foster care and are left by the wayside, they too need to be looked after. They need to yeah. be provided the uh, the the ongoing supports. Much like what we uh, you know, children who grow up in their own homes and, and leave home and go to university or college you know, have the support of their families. Well, these children don't. And so, you know, taking up response, Canada needs to take up responsibility for, for supporting these children, supporting these, you know, these future generations. Because we're, to date, we have three, over 3,000 little babies, little children that, um, you know, are, are, are now beginning to tell their story and yet we still have a future a living future of children that are young today that need our support into the future and we need help for that we need to they need help if you weren't if canada was not able to help was was not helping those children that we're finding today at least help the future so that yes. we yeah. have a future right yes our, our, you know, in the advocacy Go ahead, please. The, the advocacy of Indigenous organizations in terms of, you know, providing supports for foster kids as they're coming out of out of foster care as they're aging out, you know, in this area there's there's some um, some progress in that area, but it's not near enough. And 
I can't, you know, support your statement more. I, you know, that this is the future now. If you couldn't be there for the little ones before, be there for them now. Mm -hmm. And we know how. We know what they need. Yeah. We know what to do. What we need is the resources and the support. And you know, hopefully, that's going to continue to grow. Yeah, do you feel we're, we're kind of repeating history, aren't we? In a way. And, and just, it's never really stopped, right? Yeah. You know, it's never really stopped. The, the colonial toolkit and its impacts continue to this day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. On, that, on that note, I want to thank you both. Thank you, Dr. Gahante Horn Miller, for, for moderating uh, today and, and sharing your thoughts as well. Uh, Michelle Good, I, I can't thank you enough for, for being with us, but more importantly, for writing this book and taking so much of your life to write this book. Um, it, it's sadly fortuitous that, it, that it's coming out around this time over the past year when, when the rest of Canadian society has come to terms with something that Indigenous people have known all along. Um, but you know well that the power of, of a novel, a fiction, is very powerful in, in having people understand uh, what has happened. And it's, it's a, uh, I suppose it's a historic novel in, in that sense. Uh, because we're learning some very sad parts about our history and I hope out of this will come something better. Uh, we can keep living in hope. So thank you so much for, for writing this book and thank you for your time with us. I just want to take uh, a moment to thank our sponsors um, who are very supportive about the examination of this issue. Uh, they include Canada's Building Trades Unions, the International Association of Firefighters and Amatio, the Ontario uh, professional uh, professional employees. Uh, we have a, a session next week with uh, Jeff Regan, the former Speaker of the House of Commons, and he'll be in conversation with a couple of uh, members in, of Parliament. And I, I want to ask uh, our viewers to keep in touch with us in the in the months ahead as we continue with with this dialogue on diversity, which we started today. Uh, keep in touch with us, and I wish you the best in these difficult times. Thank you again very much, Michelle Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew.